Are you fascinated by how Jesus thinks, figures things out, looks at life, world, God, himself, and all of us? I present to you an epistemological portrait of Jesus. To get inside his head, to imagine how he thinks, I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. And here is a diagram of uh, 24 ways Jesus infers, Jesus discovers, Jesus figures things out. And I have uh, organized, uh, systematized, collected uh, such ways for different personalities and uh, different uh, disciplines. And these are ways of uh, understanding how a discipline or a personality figures things out, uh, how they use their unconscious, their conscious, their consciousness, um, how it all comes together. So it's uh, uh, fascinating to apply this to Jesus. Uh, I did this, I started doing this about uh, 12 years ago, first with myself, my own ways of figuring things out. I thought uh, people maybe don't care about my philosophy, but maybe they would be interested in the ways I figure things out. So I collected uh, 200 ways and I try to organize them and I got this system. I'll show you. And then I did it for mathematics. I did it for different disciplines. Uh, why don't we take a quick look at this one and then we'll compare it with the others just so that you get a broader picture. But when somebody like Jesus is figuring things out, among the ways there are three that kind of like are the beginning, middle, and end of it all. So for Jesus, what it seems to be, um, based on the Gospel of Matthew, and I've spent several months uh, just going through every line, trying to imagine everything that's said there. Well, how did he figure that out, right? So when he enters into just the world, something about him just resonates uh, with scripture. He just seems to be uh, pulled into it, you know, as if he was alive in it. Uh, so he receives scripture at face value. And in scripture, he seems to recognize himself and that he was sent by God. So maybe it is something like just being such a innocent and direct and um, a person whose mind could pick up on the godliness of Scripture and also maybe picking up that uh, in the world uh, there's just nothing, there's not so much comparable, you know, that really Scripture is the great excitement uh and so that's the great uh, link to God. Um, so that's, I think, the beginning point, you know, and that he's sent. He kind of recognizes, well, this is all talking about me because this relates to the way I look at things. And the people I meet, the, the world I live in, this just seems so much more distant, whereas this just seems so much more immediate to me, but maybe not always to others. Well, what is he doing with that? And so the most important way he figures things out, uh, he's engaging others in the world. He receives them with an open heart the way he wishes to be received. So that is uh, how he's doing it. And where does it all end up? In the end, it's about receiving and worshiping God as the creator of the world, as the creator of this experiment to say that there's something uh, fantastic about uh, all of this uh, and something that pushes even beyond um, his own uh, attempts to engage with this, that in the end it's, it's in God's hands. So those are the three main ones. And let's look at just some of the parts of this. So the bottom 12 are uh, pre-systemic, and the upper 12 are systemic. So before you have a system of ways of figuring things out, you kind of have to build it up. And there's this tension between two points of view. 
Uh, if you've seen my other videos, uh, I'm starting to talk more and more about the three minds. We have an unconscious mind that knows the answers, but not know why, just unconsciously. We have a conscious mind that consciously does not know. So it's just uh, asking questions. And so it has a language of words and variables and concepts, uh, slots that it could put things in. And so it's restating, re -repre representing uh, the same information in a different form. Uh, and then the third uh, mind or voice is consciousness, uh, the willful, deliberately um, fac faculty of matching those other two so that you're saying the same thing or thinking the same thing in um, your unconscious intuition and in your conscious uh, language, conceptual language, what you know, what you don't know, that it matches up. And then you decide, well, should I, in this case, act intuitively? Should I, in this case, uh, act uh, with my uh, logical principles, let's say. So unconsciously, well, let's take consciously. Consciously is really concentrating on God's word, on that which stands for everything. Uh, and then if, if that's not clear enough, then it's okay. Well, he's choosing to focus on that which lasts forever, not which is temporary. And then from that, He's understanding our relationship with God, that God cares for us as our Father, who loves us more than we loves ourselves, wants us to be alive and sensitive and responsive. And then concludes like to say, well, it's all about serving God by empathizing with others and caring for them, just as God does, so to do God's work. So the conscious approach is by really taking scripture consciously and saying, okay, I'm receiving scripture at face value, I'm sent by God, focusing all your energy on that, you end up led to caring for those in the world, that you're sent into the world to care for those in the world, for God cares about those in the world. That's the message of scripture. But there's an unconscious uh, side to this, which is, well, and maybe um, why is he... Um, attracted to scripture in the first place, unconsciously, right? So there's something about that, and this is kind of like in opposition, and there's this tension. He wants to stay free, and uh, he doesn't want to get maybe enslaved to the world or sucked into the world. And so the way he stays free, um, well, he gets used to being tossed about, okay? But he certainly wants to be staying free, okay? And this is the attraction to Scripture, is that it's a source of freedom for him. But even prior to Scripture, let's say, unconsciously, he has this desire to stay free. Uh, maybe you could say there's this holy freedom in him. Uh, maybe that's uh, part of his uh, naivety or innocence or whatever. He's not going to give up his freedom for any lures of the world, right, as we have or we do. So with that freedom, it's okay. Well, then, it's about letting events unfold, practically speaking. And that means that the wrongs will unfold first, typically, and justice will unfold later. So it's a little bit about being willing, like for the sake of freedom, and maybe there's this, um, I don't know, obedience to God or humility or whatever, but just to say, well, I'm me, you know, I'm my freedom. These things are happening, right? Uh, and um, that's the way it is in the world, you know. So maybe there is this line between him and the world. Okay, think about that. This is really just for inspiration, but to kind of get into his mind. So then, how do you deal with all these wrongs, right? Like, well, you show goodwill and tolerance and prepare to survive trials with God's help, Okay. So you get mentally say, okay, this is the way the world is, but we're going to live through it, okay? And we live through it by showing goodwill, by showing tolerance, and by always being prepared for this. And in the end, he recognizes those who pass the trials. He say, there are people who succeed who pass these trials, right? And that they are worthy of attention. They're worthy of recognition, of acknowledgement, maybe of reward but certainly they're worthy of attention. So 
what is that all about? Say unconsciously, it's about recognizing those who are not of the world. Okay, and maybe appreciating their freedom, that they're they're not they're free of the world, and that they've demonstrated that, and that this is going on. Okay, so that's caring for this those in the world on the one side, but then this is saying recognizing those not of the world. So kind of like if you're not caring about the world, you know, he's focused on scripture, which is, but being sucked into scripture, he ends up caring for those in the world. Whereas if you're in the world, let's say you have this freedom and you're tossed about in the world, then it leads you to recognize those who are not of the world. Okay, that that freedom is rooted in other people as well, and they have this commonality of being not of this world. And when you pull all that together, where does that bring you? That brings you to receiving others in the world with an open art as he wishes to be received. So coming into this, it's kind of like making explicit what he's all about. And then how is that happening practically? There's a learning cycle. There's a three cycle that's weaving this together, these two sides. So, first of all, um, he sees himself in scripture and prophecy, what that means for him and others. Okay, so he's going deep and making it concrete, like, well, what am I seeing about myself? Then he's going out and fulfilling scripture with regard to the faith others have in it. So a lot of times it's based, and maybe that's that connection with others, like, it's based on that faith, you know, in him, but also in others, that the scripture will be true. The scripture must come true. And so certain maybe good things that happen, right? They have to happen. And that he's a part of that, right? Like he's he's a living um, testimony to that. And so there's some just insistent belief that he he's participating, that the Father will hear him, you know, and the miracles will happen, right? But they'll happen in this context of the faith of others and of himself. But then what's very interesting is that he judges by the fruit, even if that contradicts scripture. So there's cases where like, you know, he is interested in the world, like, well, what's the consequence? It is relevant what the world is saying, what the world is having to, to testimony of the world. And so if people are suffering, if, if, if um, things work or they don't, he wants to know. He's quite scientific in that regard. This is the scientific Method. This is the learning cycle of taking a stand, doing a hypo you know, having a hypothesis, uh, following through, doing an experiment, and reflecting, um, which would be um, uh, well, looking at your experiment. What were the results? Right, taking an honest look after the fact. So once you have this, and this is maybe the way that he looks at things, you know, receiving others in the world with an open heart as he wishes to be received. That's the conclusion of this method, right? You can try to replicate this. That would be great. See, and you could take a different gospel. There may be different results in that case. Uh, there may be uh, different results in any case, but I think it is. it would be wonderful to try to see if this method could be replicated. So once you have this, what ends up happening in his mind is this fourfold division into these others in the world, right? Like, so, and how he relates to them. So there's, uh, he acknowledges there's people who are not open to God, okay? And maybe he's a little bit frustrated about that. Uh, maybe he just walks away from that. But he gives people the chance to do that. But if they're like that, they don't want to have this notion that you can connect with God beyond this world. And he can't connect with them on that level. Then he just lets them be. So that's one way of thinking about it. Another is uh, he thinks in parables, maintains this ambiguity for the sake of those open to God. So they ask him, uh, his uh, disciples, why do you speak in parables? You speak plainly to us, right? But to other people, you talk about goats and sheep and carrots. And he says it. Also kind of like uh, quoting Isaiah, but basically, and he says something that is very difficult to, you know, obscure to understand, basically, that I speak to them in parables so that they could um, uh, uh, listen but not hear. Uh, they could hear, you know, but not understand, and so they could be doomed, right? 
something like that. And so you have to read it very carefully. What is he talking about? What is that? What's this mystery? But And I did uh, another study of Jesus where I looked at his emotions. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is just fantastic for this. So because it's so raw, like the raw experience of Jesus. And there I looked at the expectation, you know, like if you study, why was he frightened? Why was he disgusted? Why was he sad? Why was he surprised? Why was he happy? Why was he excited? Uh, why was he anxious, let's say? Why was he at peace? There's an expectation uh, beneath all that. And I think the expectation, I have to get this right, but the expectation is that uh, we're all one, you see. So uh, if, if, if if depending on you know how the world works out, like it just may not be that way, you know. So, um, but so based on that analysis, based on thinking, it kind of got me to realize that oh, he's frightened. Like for example, he would be frightened of the demons when they would say he's the son of God. You see, and it's like why is he frightened by that? Because he doesn't tell talk to people that way because I think he has this fear of uh, taking people's freedom away. You can see how much, uh, like I was saying, he values his own freedom, right? And ultimately, you know, so he does not want to take other people's freedom away. I guess that's the basis for their relationship with God, like to have this total freedom, right? And that's the basis for the experiment that God has set up, the total freedom of individuals, right? That he's participating in this experiment. He's kind of being the advocate of God. Maybe that's how he sees himself. Like he's the part of the experiment that says, look, maybe there is a God. Maybe I could help you believe in a God, right? Maybe you could think that godliness is possible, but maybe. See, but he doesn't want to push it too far where like I command or I tell you or I force you to see that there is a God, right? Or that I am God. So if the de demons are kind of pushing it that way, he's frightened and saying, don't do that. I forbid you to do that, right? Um, so why does he talk in parables to his uh, uh, students, his followers, but not to ordinary people who are just curious, right? Uh, that is because um, if he spoke plainly to these people, uh, he might kind of like convince them, persuade them, and take their freedom away being so persuasive. Right? <laughs> but if he talks to them in parables, you see, it's left to them, and then they're in a position to decide. Also, he doesn't chase them away. He kind of gives them to decide, well, oh, I get it. I see the sense of this carrot seed, let's say, or to say, why am I listening to this? This is just nonsense, right? It gives people much more latitude, you see. So going back to Isaiah, he talks to them in parables so that they could you see, the word could is ambiguous uh, by nature. They could uh, hear, listen, but not hear, right? They could hear, but not understand. They have the choice to hear, but not understand. They have the choice to be damned. You see, they could be damned. So we, we're used to reading the could as that they must be damned. But no, it's they could. And he doesn't want to take that away. Whereas the students, the followers, they've already made that choice. So he's not taking anything away from them. So once I realize, see, and that's an example of a riddle Jesus gave us. Like maybe two thirds of what he said, uh, we uh, kind of understand, but maybe one third, like nobody seems to really understand, right? Those are riddles left for us. And I think those are encouragements to me, like, Okay, you explain that Isaiah uh, passage and quote and citation, but I think I explained it in a way where it's very Jesus-like. I mean, you, you can get it; you can see why he would say it that way. It's a riddle of two thousand years old. It's a riddle that the churches do not say. Well, here's a list of riddles we don't understand. You see that mind to say we don't know. You see they don't have that mind. So this kind of two mind approach is lacking. And a third mind to decide between those two is lacking. So any great personality, any personality, we're all great, any scientific discipline has to first, before you have a system, you have to split it up. Like, what are these two minds contributing? So there's this crucial ambiguity. But now, like, the way he thinks about himself or the, his followers, who kind of he, he equates with himself and they'll do even greater things than he does, they're basically on the same page. In doing God's will, experience the world, but pull away from it and be with God. 
So maybe there's this kind of like on the basis of this ambiguity, this kind of twofold thing. Like he gives the world a chance. He immerses himself in it. He talks to the Pharisees or people who are not only like talks to he, talk, he talks to potential followers and actual followers. But at a certain point, like he gets tired and he pulls out and he goes off into the desert. and He just bees with God. Right. Which is maybe his kind of like natural state where he feels at home, you know, like being at home with your father, your mother, your parents. Right. Um, so there's that. And then finally, he appreciates that God carries out justice. There's things like God knows he doesn't know. Uh, there's things that God, it's up for God to do, not for him to do. Uh, there's things, of course, that he does on behalf of God and that he must do uh, on behalf of God because God will not do it himself. Uh, but but he needs this God needs this context, maybe for judgment or whatever, that the judge will be of this world or in this world, at least, or familiar with this world, different things. Or maybe even sometimes as the creator. So like his role and sometimes understood as creator, like this, is, the Trinity is a fascinating thing. So but um uh, so this kind of fourfold decision, that's the systemization in God, in Jesus's mind that this is, comes to. That's his consciousness. And if you think of the three minds as a division of everything, there are actually four levels of knowledge. So you have to add, what are they minds acting on? They're acting on, let's say, let's call it the world. Okay. But that could also be his inner world, the outer world, all the world. It's the zeroth level, right? Sometimes it just could be God, right? He's, they're all thinking about God, but whatever that zeroth level is. That would be the world in which these people are just sucked in, you know, that they, 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 they're not open to God. Okay. But above and beyond that, there's these three ways. So there's whether we know, like what we know, how we know, why we know. So those curious ones, that's on the level of what? Okay, that's the first, that's like, so maybe they have this unconscious uh, aptitude for, uh, for what's beyond the world. Okay. As opposed to total denial. Okay. So, which is just a, a horrible thing to think about, but you know, that's, that's just entering into this mind, right? So the three minds, one is that there's this unconscious uh, question on what, what does this look like? What does this feel like? And so because I, maybe because it's beyond, you know, it's beyond the world. When you talk to what you have to talk in parables, in images, in, uh, in, in stories, because, uh, you know, in a layer of presentation, that's what the unconscious needs to kind of like digest. But the conscious lives in the world of not knowing. So it, it lives in a world that's much more uh, closer to the spiritual, right? And so that would be, it, it looks into the how, like, well, how do we live our lives? How do we make sense of things? How do we behave with each other? How do we approach God? It's how. And finally, like, why? Well, that would be the perspective of God. Like, why are we doing this? And so ultimately that there's this experiment going on. Um, the way I think about it um, is uh, how, you know, that the only thing that could come, in my imagination, like from a God who's all by themselves, would be this question, uh, is God necessary? Would God be if God was not? You know, because if God is, it's not very interesting. But if God was not... God being God should still somehow be should still some kind of come out of the come out of the washer come out of the picture right so that is the whole f interesting uh, way of how uh, the world could evolve and so you have like a proof by contradiction like if there's a God there's a God it's not very interesting but suppose there was not a God but somehow somehow built into that kind of assumption you can't run away from God for example like if there's not a God Maybe you have evolution. Maybe you need organisms. You know, they're, they're going to uh, distinguish, you know, do you put your resources in what you know or in predicting what you don't know? You know, like dealing with what you don't know, modeling what you don't know. Are you going to model what you know? So evolution is a history of disembodying the mind, of abstraction, where more and more and more you uh, focus on what you don't know, right? We live in these predictive minds. But then to have a third mind that kind of decides, well, okay, I'm going to control myself and which one should I really do? And, and so humans are really uh, facile at uh, connecting and choosing between those two minds. But really any creature with two hemispheres is all set up to do that, whether you're an octopus or whether you're a vertebrate, uh, whether you're a puppy, right? But like if you're a baby, somehow you're uh, kind of ready to 
get this consciousness going in a very active way as a as a full-fledged third mind that sets up the other two. Uh, with this type of uh, systemization, this type of other, you know, this type of other world that's created. And so there's these four different things. And so you can see the consciousness is actually talking about all three minds and what they're operating on. And then what's to do with this? Well, you have these six relations, and I typically draw arrows. I just didn't want to make this so busy. But so you can think of an arrow, three arrows that go like one up. And so that would be like, how does it seem to me? Would it make any difference? Would I have control over? Two arrows that would go two levels up. So all the way up here and all the way up here. And one level that would go three, one, one, one arrow that would go three levels up. So that's six ways of matching four things. It's like the Ten Commandments. It's like four positive commandments and six negative commandments. But furthermore, and I'll be making a video about this more someday, um, uh, about the counter questions. And this is in the Sermon on the Mount. I discovered these independently. Then I go, oh, these are in the Sermon on the Mount. They're called the six antitheses. Like he says, you've heard it said in the scripture, uh, you know, thou shall not kill. But I tell you, you know, so and so, don't even call your brother an idiot, right? Because uh, you'll go to hell for that. So, because that's walking in that direction. That kind of shows your attitude, right? Uh, well, Let's just say, but basically that's saying like, well, what else should I be doing, okay, to pull out? Like, so if you're stuck in the this mindset of the world, how do you pull out of that to, to doing God's will, experiencing well, pulling away from being with God? Well, you ask yourself, like, when you have this question, like, is this, um, do I truly uh, need this? Do I truly need to do this? Do I truly need to call my brother an idiot? Like, well, is, what else should I be doing? Okay, or like he gives a concrete example, like you know, you're going to present your uh, gift uh, of sacrifice to the temple, to the altar, and then you remember, hey, I call my brother an idiot, you know, uh, I should do something like that. I should be giving a gift to him, maybe, right? <laughs> to say, you know, I apologize, or or maybe I'm not even apologize. I just give him a gift to say, like, obviously you're not an idiot. I'm giving you gifts, right? So, so. Uh, or just, you know, but make it good deal with that, right? What else should I be doing? So that's a counter question, okay, uh, to a doubt, because, you know, uh, do I truly need this is a doubt, and how do you address doubts? So we'll walk through all these in detail. Uh, but I want to just list them out. Like, how does, you know, do I truly like this? How does it seem to me? Do I truly need this? What else should I be doing? Is this truly wrong? Would it make any difference? I'm sorry. Is this truly real? Would it make any difference? Uh, is this truly problematic? What do I have control over? Is this truly reasonable? Am I able to consider the question? Is this truly wrong? Is this the way things should be? So these are all ways of pulling out of a lower level and climbing up to a higher level. Okay? And those are really fascinating. Those are very practical. Okay? And these are ways he figures things out. Um, and then they all lead up to a gap. Like it's, So it's kind of making for a gap. So you took this way that he looks at things, receiving others in the world with an open heart as he wishes to be received. You made that on four different levels. What does that mean? It kind of breaks things up into four levels of different height, you know, different width, breadth, of vantage point, broader and broader minds. And then you say, okay, well, what's the, that gives you these gaps to overcome. There's these six gaps. And those six ways of having a gap, they have this unity as the gap inside of all of us. It's like the slack or the spirit inside of all of us. And that spirit that we're all set up, like we, we, we have this whole setup that opens up this gap. And the, that gap is saying, receive and worship God, creator of the world, experiment. Like in the end, Jesus, like this is what it's all about. That all you've lived your life, all you're doing, like, you know, you've created this framework in the world, for yourself, for others, for God. And this is what we gain from that. That this kind of like, uh, that God is able to reside in the world uh, through this way of figuring things out. That at certain points, it's just about embracing, receiving God in this house of knowledge, as I call it, that you've created.
So that's a long introduction. Maybe that could be most of this video because I think, you know, I've given you a lot to digest. I think, you know, maybe um, I believe that this has helping people to uh, look at Jesus in a fresh point of view and looking at Jesus and a very human point of view, right? Like you can imagine a human being like this, but you can also see that this human being, the way they're living their life is making uh, God real. Like you could say, well, everything I've said could basically just be mental fictions, you know, the, well, or simply a very um, noble, maybe Don Quixote type of attitude towards life. This person is entering into life. Maybe just to emphasize this three cycle, uh, which is also perhaps like a crucial thing, where, um, okay, he sees himself in scripture, but he is in the world, right? And so what does that mean in the world for him and others, right? He makes that connection. That's kind of like also why he's good at the parables, because he has to translate the scripture into the world that's a question how he's going to do that so maybe it's not emphasize it so translate see himself as a river, but also translate that okay so that's him taking a stand like in the world i think this is this is what it is and we'll notice that like there are there are interesting cases where he kind of corrects himself he grows as a person right so then fulfill scripture with regard to the faith others have in it a beautiful example <laughs> He's nasty to this uh, woman. Um, uh, she's not a Jew. Uh, I think she cares for her daughter. And he says, I'm not here to, you know, I'm here. I was sent, right, to the children of Israel. You're not children of Israel. So this his ability, like, to kind of compartmentalize people and say, you know, you're kind of non-human. I think uh, that's... You know, that's disturbing, right? Uh, on the other hand, I think it's done in the spirit of like his whole life is revolved around receiving people. So part of the receiving is they don't want to be received and that he'll receive them in that way. But I think also to say like, so the 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 thinking of scripture and and scripture is very problematic, you know, like, it's amazing that Jesus believes in Scripture. I'll just give you one problematic aspect of the Hebrew Bible, uh, which, you know, there's so much faith put into it. Uh, that's maybe the saving grace of the Hebrew Bible. But the fact that it's literature, like, um, look at the stories of Genesis, the Bible stories. Okay, and I'm saying this um, maybe just for the sake of balance, partly, and, and just to, for the sake of reality. Like, we live in this world, so what's going on? The stories of Adam and Eve, uh, the story, for example, of how Abraham almost sacrificed his son Isaac. It's a very dramatic story. It's a story of Noah. Um, someone like St. Paul is referencing all these stories. Even Jesus references, you know, a lot of these stories. But the Bible doesn't reference these stories, you see. You can't find a reference of, uh, you can't basically find no reference to Isaac in general, okay? Even though in, you know, Kierkegaard, I mean, others, people have been very traumatized by that story. It's a very great story, uh, how, uh, you know, Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son. But that does not happen in the thousand pages or more of the Hebrew Bible. No reference. So, um, or when there are references to different things, you realize like, but they're not referencing any of these details. Okay, so like, I, I found a psalm that kind of does reference creation, like the separation of day and night, the separation of winter and summer, right? Which isn't referenced in Genesis either. But there's no reference of Adam and Eve. There's no reference of the tree of knowledge and good evil. So all that indicates basically that, look, this was put in the very end of the Bible, like the, you know, scholars date Deuteronomy as recent, you know, the edit, editing goes down to 250 BC. Okay, not that much before Jesus' time, actually, 250 years before. These aren't legends. It's very much like King Arthur. You know, there was a King Arthur, presumably, but the legends were written like a thousand years later. They're literature. There are no surviving legends of King Arthur. They just aren't. It's all concoction. So to realize like, and I don't, I don't know why this argument isn't made more often, but look, 
it's stories like anime, they're concocted. Yeah, there were creation stories before, but this particular story was concocted later, very later, okay? And so to think Jesus in all his magnificent intelligence, his counterintuitiveness, like his ability to pick up on things, it just doesn't ever seem to dawn on him that this could just be literature. The idea, like, also, like, many... Um, you know, became more interested. I'm my background is Catholic. I'm a Catholic, but so very respect. Like, well, to understand the Hebrew Bible, uh, I would want to understand Jewish perspective. I was kind of shocked. Uh, Professor David Katz was kind enough to give me, you know, to talk with me and give me some readings to think about and uh, archaeology, which led me on this very critical path. It was disturbing critical path. Uh, but from the Learned Jews that I've spoken to see this notion of word of God is much more a Catholic type of thing. Uh, the word of God would be maybe the Ten Commandments, you see, where they actually literally spoken by God, right? But practically everything else is just on this degree of less and less and less uh, divine and more and more and more, you know, this book, right? It's author. It's in the, in the typical sense. So um, the idea that See, but with Jesus, it just doesn't seem like he pound. I mean, the other thing is that another way that he figures things out is wrong. He really seizes on contradictions. Like when he reads, he's not like a typical Bible scholar who glosses all over the, like their job is to get rid of the contradictions. Jesus's approach was to emphasize the contradictions and to emphasize God's contradictory character, the contradiction of the spirit, the freeness of the spirit, because as we look, like he wants to stay free. So contradiction for him is very kind of like, a, it's just part of his dynamic to live in that zone of contradiction, okay? So he points out hypocr hypocrisy, but, but that's not the only part of it, like, but the contradiction. And so like, you know, how King David behaved, you know, um, He's very much into, he's very sensitive to it. He's looking for it, it seems, and he uh, doesn't explain it away, but he kind of uh, explains, be, you know, what that what that means. And so all of these um, um, antitheses are very much about picking out the contradictions, you know, uh, realizing that. And the contradiction is inherent in that type of experiment. So well, this was a long aside, but... Um, uh, maybe to say that, that the scripture is problematic, and so he's starting with a problematic text that he's kind of absorbing. So there's this, but there's this woman of great faith, and she goes, even the dogs, you know, take, um, you know, get the crumbs off the table, right? He looks at her, and he goes, man, your faith is deep, <laughs> like, and I'm with you on your faith. And I'll heal you, your daughter. <laughs> so I think that that's just uh, saying, like, uh, that's his freedom. Like, he did that based on their shared faith, which he believed in. Based on their shared faith on the content of God's word, right? Like, and so they did that, and they see what happened, and it worked, right? Like, so Now, why is it working? Presumably, I think, the logical answer would be that's the way the experiment is set up. Like in this experiment of human freedom and whether, oh, so when you have these three minds, I didn't say the punchline. You have the consciousness and it, it uh, sets up the unconscious and the conscious. But you see, to really live in the consciousness, and that's my deepest value is living by truth. Um, see, like, the first mind likes beauty unconsciously. The second mind, this logical mind, likes the good or utility or morality, right? These rules that make sense. I like that too. But really, like, it's the truth that connects the two, the beauty and the goodness. So, like, your sweetheart is wonderfully, beautifully, wonderful, good, and it matches up in a, in a scientific way. <laughs> That's That third part is the part that really, you know, why oh, I don't have my sweetheart. I don't have any sweetheart. But... But that's the, that's what my whole life is about, like that truth, okay, between the beauty and the good that connects them, right? The unconscious and the conscious that connects them. Now, so to get that truth, and especially to get absolute truth, what you need to do and what I've done all my life, and I think maybe what Jesus, and what maybe we all do, you have to empty your mind. You say, 
Forget about all experience. Forget about all preconceptions. Get rid of this language of concepts. Get rid of all these neurons firing into me and just sit in the void, in the silence, in the empty mind. And that's the state that we can imagine God in. And then based on that state, trying to see, well, okay, then where do things fit together? It's very difficult, uh, but this whole wondrous wisdom basically comes from that. So to empty the mind from that. I'm getting a little bit lost, you know, where this was coming from. But so the three cycle, you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect, and so then judge by the fruit. Oh, so what I was saying is like, why do miracles happen? Well, in this experiment that God is doing, like, is God necessary? Well, so in that, for consciousness to really be at its best, it needs to empty itself out of all these things, and it's left with God. That's what it's left with. So the reality of God is that is in our world is God is that empty void that the consciousness is left with when it does its job, when it does its work uh, in the greatest way by just starting from scratch, as if you started the world from scratch, right? Like, and then the, the consciousness is contemplating God. So that's the zeroth level. And then, then you see all these structures, then you realize, well, when a person is in sync, and ultimately we're all in sync in some way, those three minds are in sync, you can think of them all as operating on God. You know, so that God is the zeroth level, and there's the first level, second level, third level, the three minds. Okay, so something in God is making the naive believers like Jesus um, have their day. Okay, where Jesus can say things like, "Everything I ask of God, like it comes, it happens." And if you've if you've ever lived, uh, you know, we we have stories to tell. <laughs> Well, it is quite, it's a long story, like what that's all about. You know, like he says, what you believe is what happens. You know, I've lived that way. I think we have, it's very, and that's the whole spirit of the kingdom of heaven. And that's the whole spirit of this culture that we're working towards together, you know, of independent thinkers. But part of that, a uh, key part of that is to say, well, what is that? Does it work out in the world? And sometimes it does. Sometimes these miracles happen on on time. <laughs> a lot of times they don't happen on time. I think that's why this notion that God does not have to be good, life is not fair, that the wrong comes first, the justice comes later, right? Like, uh, is this the way things should be? Yes, the world needs to be wrong. You know, that's the way it needs to be that way. Like, uh, uh, it can't be perfect. It can't be right. Uh, that thing. So this three cycle, that's the main thing to emphasize. That's what he's going through. And maybe to emphasize, there's this synchronicity, like he's really out on a limb as a human being. Uh, but he went on that limb because he was the kind of person to go on that limb and that limb, that ledge or that limb or that branch was the scripture that just kind of, he just walked down that plank and he was ready to walk off. Uh, he'd walk off and walk back on, you know. So, and he'd, he'd do that. Go into the desert and come back. Say, so, you know, this is a walk on the water. So, the idea that maybe that's possible, you see, it lets us not just have an unconscious mind, but to say there's a there's a, it's good to have a mind that does not know, right? There's been a lot of uh, critique of the conscious, rational, you know, logical mind, but that's the mind that does not know, you see. And it's not so much. You know, it's the mind that should be in charge by, I think, I, I have the, the, by all the evidence is saying, to, to, because it's the mind that should should be in charge. But it's actually the consciousness that should be in charge to make sure that the conscious is not bullying the unconscious, but that they're in sync. But that the consciousness is, is kind of like uh, modeling it and trying to govern it, right? But that that governance be in sync. So uh, just in terms of concluding, I do want to uh, compare Jesus, let's say, with other mortals uh, and um, compare uh, uh, him with um, just scientific wisdom. So let's look at these houses of knowledge. And maybe just to say, if I was to do more videos like this, I mean, I'll certainly going to be working on the other Gospels. But I have all the data. I did it in Lithuanian. But what I did, I did a machine translation into English. Uh, and so it's, you know, the machine translated Bible from Lithuanian into English. 
And then you can just see how I sorted everything out. So if you want to find that, there'll be a link to that. Uh, and I could talk on and on and on about that. Maybe you can do that yourself. I think I've kind of given enough concrete examples that you can, or if you know the Bible well enough, you can kind of like figure it out on your own. Um, I will be doing a video about the counter questions also, so that'll come up. It's an exciting thing. Um, so why don't we, uh, but if you write in the notes, say, hey, I'd like more of this, maybe we could have a discussion by Zoom about that too, right? So connect, connect with me on this. Uh, Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon.